Uh, welcome this afternoon to the Yale Quantum Institute. I'm Rob Sholkoff, I'm the director of the Institute, and it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce the speaker for the third of this year's Lee Page uh, lectures. Um, so if you've been following along, uh, you know that uh, we're very honored and privileged uh, to have John Preskill uh, here giving this uh, series of lectures. So John is the Feynman uh, Professor of Physics at Caltech and the uh, director of their Institute for Quantum Information and Matter. Um, and uh, uh, John has many accomplishments. Uh, early in his career, he worked in uh, uh, string theory and quantum gravity. And uh, more and more these days, uh, he's been uh, working in quantum information now for many decades and also in the connections that we were there for yesterday's lecture uh, between these things. So John uh, has received many awards. He's noted for his pedagogy. There's a long list of uh, similar invited uh, lecture series and so on that he's given many places, and we're very glad to have him here. Uh, John is a member of the National Academy. Uh, and um, also, he's contributed really fundamental things to quantum information theory, uh, together with Daniel Gottesman. Uh, they had some really seminal results in the fault tolerance, uh, which is uh, an important thing that was sort of the final nail saying theoretically one can really build eventually large-scale quantum computers. Uh, and so uh, welcome again, John, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, today's lecture about space-time and quantum error correcting codes. So, John. Well, thanks very much, Rob. It's been exciting today to be visiting the Yale Quantum Institute where such great science is being done. I'm going to be talking today about some work I did with some uh, brilliant postdocs, Benny Yoshida and Fernando Pestowski, who were until recently postdocs at Caltech, and Daniel Harlow, who's at Harvard, and visited Caltech, which is what instigated our collaboration. It was a very enjoyable collaboration, and fittingly, the author's name spell happy. <laughs> now, as you've heard in my previous lectures, if we look at the field of quantum information science, we might take the view that we are in the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of physical science, what we could call the complexity frontier or entanglement frontier. We are developing and perfecting the tools that we need to build up complex quantum states, highly entangled states, too complex for us to be able to simulate them with our digital computers, uh, beyond the reach of most of our theoretical tools for understanding how these states will behave, how to describe them. And that's going to be important for future technologies. But it's also important in giving us new ways to explore basic questions about physics. And we can expect that the ideas that we're developing about quantum information processing are going to have a broad impact on other areas of physics. And one area in which we've been seeing that happened in the last few years is quantum field theory and quantum gravity, where there's been a growing realization that concepts pertaining to quantum information, like entanglement and quantum computing and quantum error correction, are relevant to problems that are of interest to field theorists and quantum gravity theorists. And what I want to talk about today is a connection between two important ideas in physics, two of the most amazing ideas, really, that I've encountered in my scientific lifetime. So one is the holographic correspondence, holographic duality between bulk spacetimes and boundaries of spacetimes. The holographic duality, it's the best handle that we have on understanding quantum gravity non-perturbatively. And the other is quantum error correction, which is the basis for our confidence that we will be able to realize scalable quantum technologies in the not 
too distant future. And I'd like to argue that these ideas are in fact closely related, that we can think, it is fruitful to think of the holographic correspondence and quantum gravity as a realization of quantum error correction. And this idea, which we developed in the paper, built on an inspiring early paper, earlier paper, by O'Mary, Dong, and Harlow. So let me remind you of some of the things I said in yesterday's talk about the holographic correspondence. It was a particularly important for helping us to understand the issue of what happens to information that's processed by a black hole. Maldacena, in formulating this correspondence in the 90s, really showed us how to put a black hole in a bottle, in effect. The interior of the bottle is what we call the bulk, or ADS space, and negatively curved space-time. The walls of the bottle are what we call CFT, for conformal field theory. And according to the correspondence, there is an exact relationship between physics living only on the boundary and evolving according to some local Hamiltonian of a quantum field theory without gravity, and the gravitational physics in the bulk, describing in classical limit, described by classical general relativity, but also including quantum correction. So the space-time in the bulk can fluctuate and evolve. Black holes can form and evaporate in particular. And if we think about what happens to information that enters a black hole horizon, then the black hole eventually evaporates. If we look at it from the boundary point of view, where there is no gravitation and no black hole, it seems manifest that information is preserved, that the dynamics is microscopically reversible, and nothing is lost from the universe. So at least in this case, which is the situation where we understand quantum gravity the best, it seems that the formation and evaporation of a black hole does not destroy information. Now, that isn't to say we completely understand what's going on. This correspondence still hasn't given us a very concrete picture of how information escapes from inside a black hole. And it's not clear exactly what the boundary physics is telling us about the experience of an observer who falls through the horizon and enters the interior of the black hole. So there's certain, certainly many open questions, but this has encouraged us to believe that in the correct theory of quantum gravity, black hole evaporation is a microscopically reversible process. So what is this correspondence? I've tried to depict it in this picture in a rendering in which the bulk space-time is 2 plus 1 dimensional. So there's a two-dimensional slice through the bulk. And to indicate the negative curvature, I've represented that two-dimensional disk as a Poincaré disk. The colored regions in the picture are geometrically the same size, but they appear to be smaller and smaller as you get closer and closer to the boundary. That's a way of depicting that negative curvature. And according to the correspondence, there's an exact relationship between the states and the observables in the bulk and on the boundary. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of states to states and observables to observables between the two descriptions. And in the correspondence, the way we usually use it and think about it, relates weakly coupled gravity, which is nearly classical relativity, but with some small quantum corrections to the bulk in the bulk, to a very strongly coupled field theory without gravity on the boundary. And the dictionary that relates the two descriptions is very complex. So in particular, the observables that would be potentially measurable by observers in the bulk who are working locally, the local observables, those local observables deep inside the bulk appear to be very non-local when rendered in the boundary description. Now, one way of thinking about the extra dimension in the bulk relative to the boundary is that you can view it as a scale in the boundary theory. The boundary theory is a conformal field theory. It's scale invariant. And as we go deeper 
and deeper into the bulk, that corresponds to viewing the boundary physics at longer and longer distance scales or at lower and lower energy. But it's still a highly non-trivial thing that the bulk physics would look essentially strictly local in the limit of semi-classical gravity, even on scales which are short compared to the curvature scale of this ADS geometry. And what the recent developments seem to be teaching us about this correspondence is that we can think of the geometry in the bulk as arising from or being describable by entanglement in the boundary theory. And that's mostly what I want to talk about, how we can think about geometry of space-time as an emergent property related to quantum entanglement. But let me say a little bit about quantum error correction because I'm going to make use of the idea of a quantum error correcting code in this construction. And I just, for one slide, want to explain the basic idea of how quantum error correction is supposed to work to control errors in a quantum system. So let's imagine we have some quantum system, let's say it's n qubits, and it interacts with the environment, with the outside world in some way. And I can describe up that by some unitary transformation that acts on the system and the environment. And without loss of generality, I can expand the action on the system in terms of some complete set of operators that act on the system. Those are the EAs in this picture, where each one of those operators is associated with some corresponding, corresponding state of the environment. But I'm not assuming here that the states of the environment, it's rather bad notation actually, are necessarily mutually orthogonal or normalized, so there's no less, less loss of generality in what I've written down. This could describe either decoherence if states of the environment are mutually orthogonal, so the system becomes entangled with the environment. It could also describe unitary errors, unitary transformations acting on the system due to imperfect control of the system if all the states of the environment were actually the same state. And then our task is to reverse the damage, to undo this effect of the noise on the system, which might have caused it to become entangled with the environment. And we can't really undo the fact that the environment became entangled with something because we don't control the environment. But what we can do is transform the entanglement of the environment with the system into entanglement of the environment with some ancilla which we control in our laboratory. And then that ancilla can be discarded and refreshed and used again in future rounds of error correction. So this process is a kind of refrigeration, if you like. Due to the noise, entropy leaks into the system, it heats up, and we want to flush the entropy out, and that's what the error correction procedure does. If I want to eventually clear the ancilla and reuse it, I have to erase it. That's a thermodynamically irreversible process. For that, I would have to pay a power bill. Um, but in doing so, I can remove the entropy from the system and clean it up and performing many rounds of error correction, maintain it in some delicate superposition state for a long time. Now this isn't going to work for arbitrary errors acting on the system. The errors have to be of a restricted type for it to work. What we usually suppose is that the noise is fairly weak and weakly correlated so that in this expansion over error operators, the ones that occur with significant amplitude are ones of low weight, which act on a small fraction of all the qubits among the n. And um, that's what would happen for weak, weakly correlated noise. So we want to be able to reverse errors of that type. But we won't be able to do that for arbitrary states of our n qubit system. We can only get it to work for some protected subspace which has to be cleverly chosen so that the error operators act trivially on that subspace and so we can undo the damage. And so that's a quantum code, a quantum error correcting code, which has been chosen so that the errors are reversible if they're of sufficiently low weight. And what I want to describe to you is a construction of a new class of quantum codes. We call them 
holographic quantum codes, which realize some of the features of the holographic correspondence and which I think give us some insights into the nature of that correspondence. So you can think of this as a kind of tensor network realization of the holographic principle. So by that I mean we can imagine tiling a negatively curved space with polygons and associating with each of those polygons some tensor. And that tensor has two kinds of indices, some dangling indices, which we can think of as the degrees of freedom on which bulk operators act, and also some internal indices, which are contracted with the indices of neighboring tensors. And so we have, in addition, uncontracted indices all the way on the boundary. And we want to think of those uncontracted boundary indices as the physical variables of some boundary theory and the dangling indices in the bulk as the physical variables of the bulk theory. And what this tensor network actually defines, as well discussed, is an embedding of the bulk degrees of freedom in the boundary Hilbert space, which is a kind of quantum error correcting code which is well protected against a certain class of errors. So the virtue of this type of description is it's quite concrete. We can describe the dictionary quite explicitly. Uh, we can compute properties of the code, but it's only intended to be kind of a toy model of holography. It's not really the real thing. It's something that we need to flesh out further to make a richer connection between quantum error correcting codes and the holographic correspondence. Now I should emphasize that this dictionary is not complete. I said that there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between the bulk theory and the boundary theory, but that's not what I just described. I described an embedding of the bulk Hilbert space as some subspace in the boundary Hilbert space. So we, we're not taking into account all of the observables, all of the degrees of freedom of the bulk. The way to think about it is that we're interested in how to describe in the bulk the operators which, when acting on the boundary theory, uh, map low energy states to low energy states. This code space corresponding to the bulk is appropriate for describing smooth perturbations of the ADS geometry. And that corresponds on the boundary to operators that map states of low energy to other states of low energy. And if I wanted to include higher energy states, I'd have to go beyond the code space that we're talking about, and I'll come back to that later. So let's think a little bit about why it should be that local operators in the bulk in this correspondence correspond to very non-local operators on the boundary. One way of thinking about it is this that we can imagine acting deep inside the bulk spacetime with some local operator. And the bulk theory obeys, at least to a very good approximation, relativ relativistic causality. So the effects of that bulk operator will not be felt outside the future light cone of the event where that local operator was applied in the bulk. And that light cone reaches the boundary only at a much later time. So at the time that we apply the local operator, the effects of it are not at least easily visible on the boundary. And so what's happening is that when that bulk operator is applied on a particular spatial slice, there is some corresponding operator being applied on the boundary, but it's extremely non-local. Its effects can't be observed by local observers who are confined to a small portion of the boundary, at least not right away. But as the system on the boundary continues to evolve, eventually the effects of that very non-local operator become locally observable. And that corresponds to the time in which this light cone reaches the boundary. But at the time that the local operator is first applied, there's some very non-local operator on the boundary that it corresponds to. And we'd like to understand that correspondence better. Now I'm going to tell you a few things in the next few slides about this ADS 
CFT correspondence because we would like to see how these features are realized in the codes that I'm going to construct. So in this slide, there's a lot of information maybe that we don't necessarily need. But the upshot is this, that suppose I consider some part of the boundary. I call it region A here along the boundary. And some point in the ball. And I'd like to know whether the operator applied to that point X in the bulk can be reconstructed on region A on the boundary. And from what we know about the correspondence, we can make the following statement. That associated with region A, if I look at the two endpoints of the region, there's some shortest path, a geodesic, through the bulk that connects together those endpoints. And because of the negative curvature, that shortest path dips deep inside the bulk because that's the fastest way to get to the other end of A to go through the bulk rather than along the boundary. And the region that I've colored in green between A and this geodesic is called the causal wedge of region A. And if the point X lies in that causal wedge, of A, then the operator in the bulk applied at X can be reconstructed in the boundary theory on region A. And, and the way one shows this, just so you know, is that we can imagine uh, propagating the uh, classical field equations in the bulk, if we use the leading classical approximation in the bulk, those field equations are causal in the radial direction. And so if I want to know whether boundary data on A is sufficient to tell me about the effect of the operator applied, applied to X, uh, the question is whether A contains the pass light cone of X, but where the pass is now defined radially, on the boundary. And so um, there's some region here which provides sufficient data to determine x on the boundary. It's not all on one time slice, but then we can use the Heisenberg equations of motion on the boundary to squeeze it down to the time slice. And that means that we can reconstruct this operator just on the boundary uh, if x is in the causal wedge of A. Now, you can see that this is an ambiguous reconstruction on the boundary because there are lots of ways in which I could choose the causal wedge for a point x in the bulk. So for example, suppose that I divide the boundary up into three regions, which I've called A, B, and C, and consider some point deep inside the bulk. Now that point is in the causal wedge of the union of A and B. And it's in the causal wedge of the union of B and C and also the union of A and C. So according to what I just told you about reconstruction, this bulk operator, phi, it should be possible to reconstruct that on the boundary as an operator which is supported only on AB. And that means it would commute with any operator that's supported on region C. But likewise, I can. Uh, reconstruct it on BC, which means it commutes with any operator localized on A. And I can reconstruct it on AC, which means it must commute with any local operator supported in B. But that seems to mean that it commutes with all the local operators on the boundary. But that doesn't really make sense, because the field algebra of the theory on the boundary is irreducible. And the only thing that commutes with all the local operators is the identity. So that would mean the only operator we can reconstruct on the boundary on the is the identity, and that, that can't be right. So this, was, this puzzle was discussed in this earlier paper by O'Mary, Dong, and Harlow. And their proposal was that, in fact, these three different reconstructions on AB, BC, and AC really are physically different operators in the boundary theory. So in what sense can we say that they are reconstructions of the same bulk operator? Well, they act on the code space in the same way. There's some code subspace of the boundary theory. But there are many ways of physically representing an operator 
acting on the boundary degrees of freedom that acts on the code subspace in a prescribed way. And these different reconstructions correspond to physically different operators on the boundary, but they act on the code space in the same way. And what we wanted to do was to construct codes that realize this idea concretely. So another thing you should know about, as I tell you about the properties of the codes, is the distinction between what's called the entanglement wedge and the causal wedge. You, you can understand that distinction in this example. So consider a boundary region which has two connected components, which I've called A1 and A2. And so A1 has some causal wedge, colored in blue here, and A2 has a causal wedge. But suppose regions A1 and A2 are sufficiently large that if I tried to find the minimum length geodesics that connect together the four endpoints of A1 and A2, uh, the shortest way of doing so connects the endpoint of A1 with an endpoint of A2 here and here. And then the causal wedge, as distinct from the entanglement wedge, is the region contained between A1 and A2 on the boundary and these two minimal geodesics in the bulk. So that's the region colored in blue here on the right-hand side. The entanglement wedge is bigger than the causal wedge in this case. And the ADS CFT folklore is that if a point lies in the entanglement wedge of the union of A1 and A2, then it should be possible to reconstruct that operator on the union of A1 and A2. Okay. Well, that doesn't follow just from the construction that we already talked about, which only guarantees that uh, we can uh, reconstruct an operator in the causal wedge of A1 on A1 and in the causal wedge of A2 on A2. So we'd like to understand how this can be true of holography in our code construction. And this is only a hyperbolic space? This is... Um, it's been demonstrated only on an hyperbolic space? Only for hyperbolic space, right. Uh, right. And is there any equivalent hint that could be... Well, so how do we go beyond hyperbolic space? It's, it's much harder, um, and there are ideas about how to do holography for de Sitter space, for example, and asymptotically flat spaces, okay. which um, I'm not really going to talk about. It's not nearly as well understood. Okay. And the code construction that I'm going to discuss really only applies to the hyperbolic case, okay. the easiest case. Incidentally, if you'd like to know why people say that um, we should be able to reconstruct operators in the entanglement wedge of a disconnected region, that I should be able to reconstruct a local operator here on the union of A1 and A2, for example, one reason people say that is because we can ask what are the effects of entangling degrees of freedom in the bulk on the entanglement on the boundary. And there are convincing arguments that if I consider two degrees of freedom in the bulk, one inside the entanglement wedge and one outside, that if I entangle those two, that will contribute to the entanglement on the boundary between A, the union of A1 and A2, and the complementary region uh, outside the union of A1 and A2. And that really only makes sense if I can define operators uh, which are supported on A and on its complement, which can detect that entanglement between A and its complement. So operationally, in order for that bulk entanglement to have a sensible interpretation, we should be able to reconstruct local operators in the entanglement wedge. And we'd like to understand why that's so. I mentioned yesterday the holographic entanglement entropy, the correspondence between entanglement on the boundary and geometry in the bulk. It goes like this. I can consider some region on the boundary, some connected region in this case. And I could ask for the state on the boundary, how entangled is region A with the complementary region? That can be quantified by the entropy of A. If I trace out the complementary region, I get some density operator for A, which in general will be mixed if A and its complement are entangled. And the greater the entanglement, the higher the entropy of that density operator. It's a measure of how much information is missing to an observer on A 
because it resides in the correlation between A and its complement. And in order to describe that entanglement geometrically, I consider the geodesic in the bulk which connects the endpoints of region A and express the length of that geodesic in the suitable gravitational units, and that's the entropy. Or in higher dimensions, where um, let's say when the bulk is, has a three-dimensional spatial slice, this would be a surface of minimal area connecting together the boundary points of region A, but through the bulk. And the relationship between the area of that minimal surface and the entropy is exactly the relationship between entropy and area for a black hole, relating the entropy of the black hole to the area of its event horizon. So because of the hyperbolic geometry, this minimum length geodesic or minimal surface will want to dive deep into the bulk. It wants to cross the minimal number of colored regions. And the way to do that is not to follow the geometry near the surface, but to dive deep inside the bulk. OK, so I'm going to explain how we construct these codes. And then we're going to see why they have desirable properties, like the holographic correspondence between um, entanglement and geometry, reconstruction in the entanglement wedge, and reconstruction in the causal wedge. And the key ingredient in our code constructions is something called a perfect tensor. And so here's what that means. Let's imagine we have a pure quantum state of 2n particles, 2n spins, each of which is v-dimensional. And I can expand that pure state in a standard basis for the 2n spins. And that defines a tensor, which has 2n indices, each of which takes v possible values. In the pictures that I'm going to draw, for definiteness, I will be considering um, six spins, each of which is two-dimensional, six qubits. And when I say that the tensor is perfect, what I mean is that we can take those six qubits in this state and partition it into any three qubits and the complementary three. And no matter how we choose those three, the two halves of the system will be maximally entangled with one another. So that if I trace out three of the qubits, any three, the remaining three will be in a maximally mixed state. Okay? It's not obvious that such states exist, but they do. Uh, in particular, there are such perfect states for six qubits. Okay? Now, there are other ways of thinking about these perfect tensors or perfect states just by transforming Kets into bras, I can obtain from the perfect tensor, instead of a state with six qubits, a map, like a unitary transformation. Because of the perfection, it will always be unitary up to normalization. If I pick any three of the qubits, it defines a unitary map from those three to the complementary three. Or I can consider it to be a mapping of two qubits to the remaining four, or one to five. And in this case, uh, since this is unitary, this will be an isometric embedding. So uh, here, for example, I'm describing a single qubit being mapped in an inner product preserving way into the Hilbert space of five qubits. And in fact, these mappings of two qubits to four and one qubit to 5 are well-known examples of quantum error correcting codes, which protect, protect against erasure of some of the qubits. Now, what does that mean? So when I say that we can protect against erasure, what I mean is that if an error occurs in which some of the qubits become inaccessible, they're lost, I can nevertheless decode the qubit that's embedded in the code space without having to access the erased qubits. I'm able to use the information of which qubits disappeared. I know which ones were erased. 
And if I have that information, then I can reconstruct the encoded system. So in this case, our embedding of one qubit into five defines a quantum error correcting code with one encoded qubit embedded in a block of five which is protected against erasure of any two of the five qubits. If any two are erased, I can still correctly decode the protected qubit. So why is that true? Well, we can think about it this way and see that it follows from the fact that this one to five map is related to a perfect tensor. Now, suppose I consider the qubit that's going to be embedded in the code block. To keep track of what happens to it, I imagine maximally entangling it with some reference qubit, which I've denoted R. Then there's a block of five qubits, and any two of those I can imagine are erased. Those are the ones shown in red. But because the tensor is perfect, that means that the system consisting of R and the two erased qubits is maximally entangled with the three unerased qubits shown in green. So that means, in particular, that the reference qubit is um, a subsystem of these three unerased qubits, no matter which three we choose. Now, the information is redundantly encoded in such a way that you can take any three out of the five qubits, it doesn't matter which three, and you can recover the encoded operation. And in fact, if you want to apply any logical operation, any transformation to the encoded qubit, it suffices to perform an operation that just acts on three of the qubits, and it doesn't matter which three. Any three will do. So now, what's a holographic code? Well, you can think about it this way. Let's suppose I take a hyperbolic geometry and I cover it with pentagons. So this is a tiling by pentagons that I couldn't do on a flat plane, but which I can do on a negatively curved two-dimensional surface where four pentagons all meet at a vertex. And now, associate with each one of those pentagons this map that takes one qubit to a block of five, the quantum error correcting code that I just told you about. Okay. And so let's imagine that we start right in the center of the bulk. So we have one qubit that we would like to be protected, and we encode it in this block of five. But then, working uh, radially outward from the center, I consider a sequence of maps um, in which I use either my two to four isometric embedding or the three to three unitary map to take the incoming qubits represented by the black lines and any dangling qubits represented by the red dots and map those to outgoing qubits which are shown as black lines lying further radially outward. So I've composed together many maps, each of which is either a unitary or an isometric embedding. And the composition of these isometries is also an isometry. And so what we wind up with is an isometric, inner product preserving map of all of the bulk variables shown as red dots to the uncontracted indices on the boundary of this tensor network. So we are to think of these uncontracted legs on the boundary as the physical qubits of a quantum code, and all the red dots in the bulk as the qubits of a code space, which is embedded in the Hilbert space of those boundary qubits. And that's what I mean by a holographic code. Now, I can also consider other tilings. Um, I can also uh, thin out my bulk degrees of freedom, if I wish, as I've done here. That's just another code. Uh, in this case, I've tiled with pentagons and hexagons. The hexagons don't have any bulk indices. They only have the internal indices that are contracted. And associated with each pentagon is one logical index of the code that corresponds to some bulk variable. OK. So now we'd like to understand this idea that operators can be reconstructed on the boundary when the operator is in the bulk, 
and lies in the causal wedge of that boundary region. So I'd like to think about it this way. I can construct what I'll call a greedy causal wedge. Greedy is a word that computer scientists use to speak of optimization algorithms that can be carried out one small step at a time. So imagine we start at the boundary, and I would like to uh, push a curve on the boundary further and further into the bulk in a sequence of small steps. And I'll be able to make such a step if that curve shown as the red dotted line uh, crosses at least uh, three outgoing legs. And then I can move the red line one step inward and now think of this extra pentagon is as an isometric map of these two incoming indices and the bulk indice index to these three. And so as I push further and further into the bulk, I'll obtain an isometric map from all of the black lines which are crossed by the red cut and all of the bulk degrees of freedom that we've swept past as the red curve goes deeper and deeper into the bulk. That's all isometrically mapped to the, the boundary degrees of freedom that live in region A. Okay? So I keep pushing inward until I can go no farther. And that defines what I mean by the greedy causal wedge. And by construction, everything that lies within the greedy causal wedge of A can be reconstructed as an operator, which is supported only on A. So now, how should we think about the ryu takianagi relationship between entanglement on the boundary and geometry in the bulk? Well, um, for region A, I can consider some cut through the bulk, which um, crosses the contracted indices um, in the bulk. And now we can think of this as a uh, sum over tensor products of vectors in A and its complement because we obtain a tensor contraction uh, associated the, associating the values of the indices along the cut to states of A from the tensor P that we obtain by contracting together all the tensors to the right of the cut. And we get a map of all the degrees of freedom along the cut labeled by I through the tensor Q, the contraction of everything to the left-hand side of the cut into region A. So this is a sum of a tensor product of some state in region A, which is indexed by I, which uh, labels the, is one state of the indices crossing the cut, uh, tensored with, um, sorry, I think it's P in region A with Q on the complementary region. Now in general, these states are not necessarily um, orthogonal or normalized. But if this tensor P and Q, if these are isometric embeddings, uh, then these will be mutually orthogonal states. And that means that the entanglement between A and A complement, the amount of entanglement, will just be determined by the number of possible values for I. It will have a maximally mixed state in some subspace whose dimension is determined by the number of possible values for i. And now one can give a, a graph theoretic argument showing that if we have no um, positive curvature anywhere in the bulk, then the greedy geodesic for region A will match the greedy geodesic for its complement. And so that means we actually have an isometric map associated with this tensor P and this tensor Q. And this state is a maximally entangled state of two subsystems, one for A and one for A complement. The dimension, the number of values for A, is just the number of values of the indices I along the cut. And if the spins along the cut take V possible values, 
uh, that dimension is just v raised to a power, which is the length of the cut, the number of indices that it crosses. And the entropy is just given by the log of that number. So it's proportional to the length of the cut. And that's the Ryu Takianagi formula relating entanglement to geometry. So now uh, we'd like to understand this reconstruction in the entanglement wedge. Um, the case in which uh, this can be explained um, maybe most clearly is let's imagine that there's some procedure or some process on the boundary that in an independent and identically distributed way erases boundary qubits. So in other words, suppose each one of the boundary qubits is either erased with probability p or left unerased with probability 1 minus p. And then the question I'd like to ask is whether bulk operators, which are deep inside the bulk, can be reconstructed on the unerased qubits. Okay? But this is a case in which there's a big difference between the causal wedge and the entanglement wedge that I defined earlier. Because if the erasure probability is small, say, then the um, unerased qubits will consist of segments which there will be fluctuations, but typically they'll have a length which goes like some, something like 1 over p, if there's a probability of p for each boundary qubit to be erased. And then there will be small gaps between those different regions of unerased qubits, but there will be many islands of unerased qubits with small gaps between them. And so the causal wedge of each one of those islands will reach only a little ways into the bulk, but the entanglement wedge will contain the whole center of the bulk because the shortest um, geodesics that connect together all the boundary points will just span the erased regions. Okay? So if we erase the boundary qubits with some sufficiently low erasure probability, uh, then with very high probability, the entanglement wedge is going to contain all the points deep inside the bulk. And we'd like to see how the bulk operators acting at those points can be reconstructed on the boundary. Well, there's an e another case which is a little easier to think about, the case in which the, um, our tensor network just has the structure of a tree. So let me describe that case first. So suppose we take our encoding of one logical protected qubit in a block of five. And then for each one of those five, we encode that in a block of five. And then for each one of those five, we encode it in a block of five and so on, just recursively encoding level by level. That's an example of what the quantum coders call a concatenated quantum code. It's just a recursive hierarchy of codes within codes. And now we could ask if qubits at the uh, lowest level, furthest out along the tensor network are erased with some IID erasure probability p, can we correct all that erasure and reconstruct the logical information at the center? Well, the code, the five qubit code is correct, is protected against two erasures out of the five qubits in the block. So in order for the information to be erased so that the erasure cannot be corrected, there would have to be three or more out of the five qubits that would be erased. So the um, probability that there's an uncorrectable erasure in the block of five if the erasure of the qubits occurs with probability p will be of order p cubed, and with a uh, combinatoric factor, which is just the number of ways of choosing three qubits out of five, which is 10. Okay? So as we uh, work our way inward from the outermost leaves of this tree 
uh, to deeper and deeper levels into the bulk, the probability that the erasure remains uncorrected drops off very quickly because the probability of an uncorrected erasure at the first level just goes like uh, 10 p cubed, but then at the next level, 10 p cubed gets cubed and multiplied by 10, and then it gets cubed again and multiplied by 10, and so on. So the probability of an uncorrected erasure, if there are altogether j levels to the tree, uh, falls off doubly exponentially with j, like p over some critical error probability, to a power which is 3 to the j. And every time it gets cubed. And that critical error probability, according to this estimate, is 1 over the square root of 10. So we'd like to do a similar type of analysis for a holographic code, but it's a little bit trickier because the code isn't really a tree. And that means that although the erasure process might be IID on the boundary, we can think of erasure of different qubits as being independent, that will no longer be true as we move in from the boundary. Then we start to get correlated erasure errors because a uh, single one of the uh, blocks at uh, you know, level j can feed into two blocks at level j plus one. But this isn't really as bad as it might seem because of the hyperbolic geometry. That prevents the correlations in the noise from propagating outward very much. So at each level, as we go deeper and deeper into the bulk, we really only have to worry about correlated errors between neighboring qubits. And that makes it possible to analyze the problem and show that, once again, the probability of an unerased or an uncorrected erasure error, once we reach the center of the bulk, will become doubly exponentially small in the number of layers in the tensor network. Although now the uh, power that appears here is a little bit different, involves the golden ratio, and this analytic estimate gives us a critical value for the erasure, prob erasure probability, which is about 0.08. But if we actually do numerics to uh, see how things go, in a case like this where to understand what happens deep in the bulk, I just consider the code with one protected qubit in the center and all the other indices contracted, then the threshold value of the erasure probability is, appears to be one half. And so that means that if I want to be able to reconstruct um, a bulk operator on some subset of the boundary, and that subset is a randomly chosen subset that contains at least half of all the qubits on the boundary, then with very high probability, the reconstruction will be possible. Okay? So the bulk degrees of freedom are very robust against erasure of the boundary, and correspondingly, um, we can reconstruct the operators which are deep inside the entanglement wedge. Sorry, what's the point of having a PC of 0 0.083 and, and then saying, well, actually, we're probably off by a factor of five or something? Well, because I wanted to show you that it is possible to give an analytic argument uh, that there is a threshold. And that means that uh, once the erasure probability is less than 0.83, then we're guaranteed analytically to be able to reconstruct the operators deep inside. But our, you know, uh, our analytic estimate is much too pessimistic. And the actual threshold is as high as it could possibly be. It's one half. It couldn't be higher, because if we could correct a ratio of more than half the qubits, then that would violate the no cloning theorem, because I could divide the uh, qubits into two sets, and if I could correct erasure in both of them, then I would be able to clone. So as we've seen, there's something very robust about this relationship between the bulk degrees of freedom and the boundary degrees of freedom. There's something kind of pleasing about that, that if we want to think of the 
geometry as being an emergent property of the entanglement on the bulk, uh, we would like the properties of the geometry to not be so sensitive to the exact state on the boundary. And once we get deep in the bulk, the details of what's going on in the boundary become not so important for doing the reconstruction. Now, I haven't talked about black holes, but remember I also had mentioned that we don't really have the complete dictionary here because we're only describing some code subspace of the boundary Hilbert space. Well, why is that? Most of the states on the boundary are very high energy states. What do they correspond to in the bulk? Large black holes. The large black holes have many microscopic degrees of freedom. And if there's an exact match between the Hilbert space of the bulk and the Hilbert space of the boundary, then actually most of the states uh, in the bulk, or most of the states in the boundary, should correspond to black holes in the bulk. So if we really want to complete correspondence, then we have to include the black holes. And they haven't been part of our discussion so far because our code space has only attempted to describe logical operations acting on the low energy states on the boundary. So one way of picturing the black holes is we can imagine cutting a hole in the tensor network, and that will leave additional uncontracted indices in the bulk. Those correspond to the black hole microstates. And now what our isometric embedding does is it maps all of the black hole microstates and the bulk degrees of freedom outside the black hole to the boundary Hilbert space. So that's the story of holographic quantum codes. It is not the full story of holography. It's really my attempt to understand holography. It's always seemed so mysterious that somehow there could be this exact correspondence between two different descriptions of the same physics. But it smelled like quantum error correction because of the feature that the bulk observables deep inside the bulk correspond to very non-local operators on the boundary, just the kind of encoding that is well protected if the environment is looking at the system locally. It can't see that bulk information. And so in this construction, we tried to make that idea more precise and concrete. It illustrates how quantum error correction can resolve this causal wedge puzzle. That is, that we can reconstruct the same boundary operator in multiple ways because the different reconstructions, although physically different on the boundary, act in the code space on the same way. And we can see how the ryu takianagi relationship between entanglement and bulk geometry is realized in this concrete setting. There's a lot of flexibility in how we do the construction. For ease of drawing, I've stuck with a two-dimensional rendering of the bulk space. We can consider tiling in higher dimensions by polyhedra and again use a perfect tensor construction to get similar results. Uh, we can choose different types of tilings and as I mentioned in passing, we can, if we want to describe lower dimension code subspaces or a thinned out version of the observables in the uh, bulk, we can just choose the tiling appropriately in order to do so. There's a lot missing from this descrip description. First of all, it's just kinematic. It's only attempting to understand the relationship between the bulk and the boundary at some fixed time. It would be much more interesting to talk about dynamics, to consider how our code space evolves according to some local Hamiltonian acting on the boundary Hilbert space, and that's something we're still thinking about. And it hasn't uh, helped us to understand the locality in the bulk on distances that are small compared to the ADS curvature because we've only associated a degree of freedom with each one of our polygons, which has a size which is comparable to the curvature radius. So as I said at the end of my talk last time, I think these connections between quantum information and quantum gravity are very intriguing. They're giving us new ways to think about some uh, very hard problems, and I think that's going to lead to further progress, but we're still 
in the early stages of exploring these connections, just as, as I've said, we're just at the early stages of the exploration of quantum information science, and we have a lot to look forward to as we develop the experimental tools to study highly entangled systems in new ways. And I think the most exciting, to me, message from this connection between quantum entanglement and quantum geometry is that potentially it makes quantum gravity a subject that can be studied experimentally in tabletop experiments because what we would like to understand better is what types of highly entangled systems have some kind of holographic dual description. We know some examples of that, but I think it's a much more generic phenomenon and we haven't yet understood exactly what the connections are between complexity of a quantum system and an emergent geometry. We haven't understood it very well because it's very difficult. It involves understanding properties of highly entangled systems that we can't simulate very well and that we don't have the theoretical tools to study in sufficient depth. So I'm hopeful that people at the Yale Quantum Institute someday will be doing experiments which will give us insights that we couldn't have derived in other ways from laboratory experiments. So thanks, it's been exciting to be here at Yale the last few days and I appreciate everyone's hospitality and generosity and thanks for listening to all my talks. Thanks very much, John, um, uh, the, uh, for today's talk and for a really great series. And just to clarify, it would be great if we would be able to do something uh, with a quantum computer that would contribute to uh, black holes, but we're not going to actually build a black hole here. <laughs> so, in this room. Um, so questions for John? Um, as a practical matter, is it possible to turn other sorts of errors into erasure errors, say by like some local error detection? John, can you repeat the questions and we'll sort of the questions? So the question was, as a practical matter, is it possible to turn erasure errors into other types? Other, other sorts of errors. Right? Well, I guess uh, let me uh, answer a slightly different question than the one you asked. So we could ask, suppose we have a code which protects well against erasure. What can we say about how well that code will protect against more general types of errors? And in fact, if we can correct against, um, in a block of um, n qubits, if we can correct against 2k erasure errors, and by that I mean we know which of the 2k qubits out of the n have been damaged and we can use that information to recover, then that same code can be used to correct against k errors in the block when the k errors occur on unknown qubits. So the codes that correct against erasure can also be used to correct against more general errors, but the error correcting power is reduced if we don't know which are the qubits that are damaged. So in the pentagonal tiling we have logical qubits which are, the num their number is proportional to the size of the boundary and physical qubits that are proportional to the size of the, sorry, logical proportional to the size of the bulk and physical proportional to the size of the boundary. But isn't the boundary supposed to be smaller than the bulk? And don't we need more physical than logical qubits? Well, remember it's a hyperbolic geometry. So, so I, sorry, the question was, it, it seems, um, that we have embedded the bulk in the boundary, but um, shouldn't the boundary be smaller than the bulk? Um, so in fact, um, in this hyperbolic setting, the boundary should not be smaller than the bulk. It's uh, part of the reason that our uh, understanding of holography is a most complete in the case of anti-de-sitter space. So we can have an exact correspondence 
between states living on the boundary and states living in the bulk because in a hyperbolic geometry, you know, the, the boundary and the bulk actually have, if you discretize them or tile them, they actually have comparable cardinality. Mm -hmm. Had a, I guess, a more elementary question of the same type. Uh, how would you distinguish bulk from the boundary if you have a discrete system, right? So you're talking about some kind of a network, basically. Right. It's sites. And is there a rational way to distinguish bulk from boundary? Well, um, so you mean if I, if I just gave you the graph of the tensor network, right. how yes. would you know? Um, well, in the case of, of this construction, I think um, there is a, you know, an unambiguous, unambiguous way of doing that because of the structure of the geometry that we tiled. In general, of course, it would not be an easy thing to do. If I just gave you a graph, it would be rather arbitrary to say what was the boundary and what is the bulk. Um, but uh, you know, if you like, um, there's a graph, and I am going to use that graph to describe a relationship between two Hilbert spaces, and I will, by fiat, say I'm interested in these as the boundary qubits and regard those as physical and the others as logical. So, but this was a particularly natural way of choosing the graph to correspond okay. to ADS space. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the property of the graph that corresponds to hyperbolic geometry? Then? Well, uh, well, it has um, for our and uh, for our discussion. It was important that when we um, when we constructed this uh, um, this isometric embedding. The way I described it, when well, I went too far, I guess. When we um, started in the middle and then composed isometries to build up big isometry, in each step, I needed to have a number of uh, incoming legs, which was uh, at most three. And so for each one of the pentagons, including the dangling uh, index in the bulk, um, I had at most two indices which were contracted with pentagons which were deeper in the bulk. And so the uh, tensor contraction defied, defines a composition of maps, each of which take uh, two or three qubits to either four or three. And so each one is either a unitary or an embedding. And the fact that the graph had that structure um, was, uh, well, it would not have had that structure if there had been a bubble of positive curvature somewhere in the bulk. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like points that, if I understood correctly, it looks like points that are closer to the boundary um, are written on, are, are encoded on a, a smaller portion of the boundary, is that right? Does that have any implications on the robustness of the uh, code? And are there uh, are there other um, graphs that that sort of privilege all the points in a different way? So you, I guess you're uh, you're noting that um, you know we don't have a you know a, per, a complete translational symmetry, or if I rotate the graph that I can do. There are discrete rotations um, that I have to make, you know, because there's a big difference between uh, this gap here and these guys being close together. The graph doesn't look like it's as symmetrical as one would, as one might like. Is that what you meant? Or? I meant more that um, in this, this causal slice, it looked like if that uh, the, the information on one qubit is written on a, a smaller portion of the boundary if it's closer. Maybe I missed Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so you're saying that if I consider, uh, say, a bulk degree of freedom which is close to the boundary, it is not as well protected against erasure as bulk variables that are deep inside. And that, that's correct. 
So that's in fact why in my discussion of the entanglement wedge, I emphasize reconstruction of the operators that are very deep inside. The ones that are deep inside are very well protected. The ones that are very close to the boundary are much easier to damage because you need to erase only a smaller hunk of the boundary. Right. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in a quantum computer, like erasure happens as a result of the computer interacting with the environment. But in a in an ADS space time, where where is the where is the what's the analogy of the environment here? Where where is this? A, what is causing this erasure? Well, I didn't necessarily mean that the erasure should be regarded as a physical process. I was thinking about erasure as a way of keeping track of the ways in which bulk operators could be reconstructed on the boundary. So when I spoke of erasure, I meant I can consider some set of unerased qubits and ask whether a certain bulk operator can be reconstructed with support only on those unerased qubits. And if it can be, then you know I say that um, that bulk operator corresponds to an operator that is supported only on that unerased set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why don't you show me in thanking John? For